Welcome to this week's online service. It is coming to you from Howwood Parish Church. It's a service for the people of Howwood and also for St Paul's Church and Johnston and anyone else who cares to join us. Wherever you are, you are most welcome. Let us worship God. Let us sing to his praise the hymn 209, Father, we praise you, now the night is o'er. Let us pray. O God our Father, we come before you at this time to offer you our worship and praise. We come to speak to you in prayer. We come to listen to your message to us. Take away from us all that would distract us from your message. Take from us everything that would keep us from hearing your voice. Take from us the inattentive mind and the wandering thoughts, the cold heart and the weak will, the self-will which disregards the truth, the prejudice which cannot hear or see the truth but which sees only what it wants to see, the desire not to be disturbed, which is afraid of the truth. Take all these things from us and enable us to listen attentively to you. We echo the prayer made by your servant Samuel of old. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Speak to us the word of encouragement when we are discouraged and depressed, the word of warning when we are likely to go astray, the word of comfort when life has hurt us, the word of guidance when we do not know what to do or where to go, the word of strength to enable us to resist our temptations, the word of power to make us able for work and ready for any burden. Whatever word we need, speak it to us now. Help us to hear your word and then to return to our lives in the world ready to obey your word. We offer this our prayer through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now a talk for the children. I have a little granddaughter 
who will turn two next month. One of the things that she likes to do is to play with Play-Doh. And I have some Play-Doh of hers here with me today. Now, when she plays with the Play-Doh, she talks about making cakes. But she knows they are not cakes for her to eat. She says they're cakes for the cat, who incidentally is called Maisie. Anyhow, one of the things she does with the Play-Doh is to take shapes and cut them out of the Play-Doh. Her favourite one is actually the moon, and her second favourite is the one I have here in the shape of a heart. So I'm going to do exactly what she does, and that is to cut a heart shape out of the Play-Doh. So it's pressed hard into the Play-Doh, and then hopefully it will work and come out. But unfortunately, like all children's addresses, it's going slightly astray, and I have to ease it out. And what I'm left with is the heart shape, maybe not just precise because of the way I've taken it out. But if my little granddaughter, incidentally, her name is Ailey, if she were here, she would say two hearts, this one and this one. But I would say she's wrong. There is only one heart, because what we have in the original Play-Doh is a missing piece, a missing heart. And we could say that this Play-Doh is heartless. The Play-Doh is heartless because the shape of the heart is missing. Now, sometimes girls and boys, and sometimes men and women too, can be heartless. When they hear about someone in trouble, they don't care. They're not sensitive. They don't have feelings for the other person in trouble. We say of other people that they've got a big heart. I'm not sure that's a particularly big one. But we say of people they have a big heart because they do care about others. They love them. They try to help them. They're sensitive about their feelings. They care when they're in trouble. So, out of this Play-Doh comes a challenge for the children and for the adults too. What kind of person are you? Are you the person with the big heart who cares for others? Or are you the heartless person? Like this piece of Play-Doh without the shape of a heart. Are you heartless, not caring for others? Jesus taught us to love one another to love our neighbours as ourselves, and he even taught us to love our enemy. So let's try to be the person with the big heart. Amen. Now we're going to sing a children's hymn, 544, When I Needed a Neighbour, Were You There?
let us hear the word of God. Our Bible lesson today comes from the Old Testament in the book of Genesis, chapter 25, reading from verse 27 through to verse 34. It's a story about Esau and Jacob, the sons of Isaac and Rebekah. The boys grew up and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was a quiet man staying among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That is why he was called Edom. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. Look, I am about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you to fan the flame of love in our hearts, to give warmth to the words of our lips and the thoughts of our minds as we pray for others. We pray for all whose love has grown cold in situations where marriages are under strain, where there are tensions between generations. Help them all to live with one another in gentleness, understanding, and good humor. We pray for all in situations where bitterness and hatred exclude love. For lands where men and women of differing race or color fail to see their human brotherhood. And for communities torn by civil strife. We pray for those parts of the world where warfare rages or smoulders, that its futility as a way of solving problems may soon be seen. Teach all who fight the worth of peace and tolerance. We pray for all who have the responsibility of governing our country, of managing our industries and leading the trade unions, and we find it difficult to see how love should be applied. We pray for those concerned with the penal system as they seek to maintain the worth of the individual and the safety of the community. We pray for those who negotiate wages and working conditions. Teach all our leaders to fight for justice and not for sectional interest. We pray for your church, established on earth to be a community of love, and yet so often divided and disputing. Teach her anew the reconciling power of Christ, that by her life and witness she may advance his kingdom in the world. Keep us, O Lord, united in faith and hope and love with those dear to us, who have entered into their rest and with all the faithful departed and bring us in the end to your eternal joy. Hear all our prayers, O God, for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, our Father, and the Holy Spirit, one God, forevermore. And hear us as we continue to pray in the words which Jesus himself has taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our next hymn is one that is well known and loved by the people of Howwood, but I suspect it may not be known by the folk in St. Paul's. It comes from a book known as Songs of Fellowship. The number is 1030, and it's called The Lord's My Shepherd. Libby is going to play it through for us, play the whole of the first verse once, and then maybe everyone will have picked up the, the tune and consequently be able to sing. So Songs of Fellowship 1030, The Lord's My Shepherd, I'll Not Want. Take as a text the closing words from the Bible reading this morning, Genesis chapter 25, verse 34. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank, and then he got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Let me fit that story into its context in the Bible. In recent weeks, we've worked our way through some of the passages in the book of Genesis, and we've come across the figures known as the patriarchs. There was Abraham and his wife, Sarah. They had a son called Isaac, 
And we thought last week about how he married Rebecca. Isaac and Rebecca had two sons. They were, in fact, twins, Esau and Jacob. Esau was born slightly ahead of Jacob, so that made him the firstborn and entitled him to certain rights, particularly the right of birth, birthright. We'll think about that in a moment. When they grew up, Esau became a hunter and was keen on going out into the open countryside. Jacob preferred to stay at home, and it would appear from the passage that we read that he had an interest in cooking. So one day, Esau was out hunting. He came home without having killed anything. He was exhausted and he was hungry. He found that Jacob was busy cooking a stew. The smell of it wafted to his nostrils and he was very much enticed. He begged Jacob to give him a share. And Jacob struck a bargain with him, a very hard bargain. He would give his brother food to eat, but on condition that Esau gave up his birthright. Esau was so desperate He did give up his birthright. Now you may wonder what the birthright was. As the firstborn, he was entitled to two things. One was to be head of the extended family. The extended family was a bit like the clan system in Scotland. So you could say that part of his birthright was to be chieftain of the clan. The other entitlement was a double portion of his father's estate when Isaac died. In our society, most families try to divide up an estate fairly. A parent would leave it in their will that if they have two sons or daughters, then this estate is divided 50-50. Not so in ancient society or in biblical lands. The way they functioned was that the elder son got a double portion. So Esau would end up with two thirds and Jacob with one third. But because Esau gave up his birthright, he lost out on that share. It was, as I say, a hard bargain. And the point is this, Esau took a short term view of things. He was so desperate to get his share of the stew that he gave up the birthright with all that that entailed. And the lesson for us is not to take a short-term view of things, but try as far as we can to take a longer-term view. We do take a short-term view in many ways. It may be that someone does something that annoys us, we become angry, We lose our temper and we say things that are hurtful. In one sense, it makes us feel good because we've got it off our chest. But in the longer term, it may have damaged our friendship and may even have damaged it beyond repair. It's better, if at all possible, to take a longer view of things. We may even be a bit like Esau when it comes to eating. We may enjoy eating things that are very sweet, full of sugar, or maybe we prefer something salty. But these things can, over time, have a damaging effect on our health. Too much sugar can lead people to form diabetes. Or it may be that someone likes smoking, and an odd cigarette may not actually do too much harm. But over the years, it builds up. And 30 or 40 years later, a person who has smoked may have problems with their health. It is necessary to take the longer term view, not the shorter. We've seen it demonstrated in recent weeks with the pandemic. As restrictions have eased, some younger folk have not kept within the existing restrictions. They've gathered with their friends at parties. No doubt they've consumed alcohol. And once they've been drinking, 
they're less keen to observe social distance. And so the virus has spread again. They haven't thought about the longer term consequences. Their concern was the pleasure of the party. They may have contracted the illness themselves and they may go on to carry it out to their parents and even their grandparents. It is important to take a longer term view of things. We live in a world of consequences, a world of cause and effect. And we have to realize that the things we do will have repercussions later. Sometimes they're not terribly significant, but other times they are. And that's why it's important we take a long-term view of things. Now, all this may sound like simple, practical advice, but there is a spiritual dimension to it as well. If we take the short-term view of things, then we fail to take account of eternity. As Christians, we believe in a God who is eternal. And we believe that he provides life beyond the grave for those of us who follow him and trust in him during our life on earth. And we need to bear that in mind as we go about our lives. There is a story told about Thomas Chalmers who was a famous churchman in the 19th century. In his early ministry, he had the parish of Comane in Fife. But while he was there, he worked five days a week lecturing in mathematics at the University of St Andrews. And at that time, he boasted that only one day in the week was what was required to run a country parish. Later in the General Assembly, it was thrown in his face that he had said such a dreadful thing. And he admitted it. And he said, what is mathematics? It is to do with magnitudes. And I forgot two magnitudes. I thought not of the littleness of time. And recklessly, I thought not of the greatness of eternity. And that's the point. If we take the short-term view of things, we forget the greatness of eternity. Let's not make the mistake of Thomas Chalmers. Let's not make the mistake of Esau. Let's always consider the longer-term view of things, especially the eternal dimension. Amen. We conclude this service with him 459, crown him with many crowns.
grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and always. Amen. <laughs>